is the good stuff, the funky stuff. They have this distinct kind of lost draw nose on them. Again, really good acid. A movement that's happening in the Texas wine scene right now. The liquid culture. What is up, everybody? Thank you for being here on another episode of The Liquid Culture with me, Mitchell Chirac. Appreciate having you guys here today. Today, what we're doing is we're going to get into three different wines, all Morvedra, my favorite grape varietal. You'll see a lot more on Morvedra on this site. Today, we are jumping in to Texas Morvedra, as you can probably tell from the label on this guy here. So, uh, had these bottles on hand, Three different producers, three of my favorite producers in Texas, my favorite grape. We've got some differences in the in the wines here, obviously, in the different producers, different vineyards, different uh, vintages. And what I wanted to do was, because I had these on hand, I wanted to try them next to each other. I've never tried them next to each other. Some of them I've tasted before, past vintages, some I've tasted these exact wines before, but never side by side. So I wanted to have an opportunity to talk a little bit about Texas wine, a little bit about Morvedra, and have a fun wine tasting with three side by side. So uh, let's start by talking a little bit about the Texas wine industry. Yes, I'm from Texas. I live in Texas. My in-laws have a winery in Texas, but you're not going to see this turn into some kind of Texas all the time, uh, wine blog, my focus is on wine and beer and spirits in general, and just because I have ties to Texas doesn't mean that's all I'm going to be talking about. In fact, you'll probably see very little uh, on Texas wine, especially in the in the early stages while uh, the Texas wine industry is still getting off the ground. However, the Texas wine industry has been in place for quite some time, and it uh, really hasn't been until maybe the last five years or so that the Texas wine quality has really started to actually make an impression on me. Uh, it still is not really big in the overall wine world mindset. People don't really know Texas yet. It's still kind of maybe for those who have heard about it, maybe thought about in that category of like where New York wines were a few years back where people were just like, oh yeah, yeah, they're trying down there, but nothing really good's coming out of it. Not the case anymore. Texas wine is going to make a big, big splash here pretty soon because good quality fruit is coming out of Texas. Good quality winemaking techniques are being used. Therefore, good fruit, good winemaking techniques, good wine. We're going to find out today. Uh, Morvedra. Let's talk about Morvedra. So, some of you may be familiar with Morvedra. Uh, it's found in Spain. Uh, you'll see it uh, named there. It's, it doesn't go by Morvedra in Spain. It's Monastral or Mataro. Uh, also in France, Bandol is uh, the big region there, as well as in the Southern Rhone, where you'll see it blended primarily. Uh, in the New World, California, GSM. Morvedra is the M in GSM. So, chances are, uh, if you're a wine drinker, You've probably had some more Morvedra before. In Texas, we are using it as a light style Morvedra. So Morvedra is typically, uh, in the old world, you see big dark color, big strong tannin, but very complex, very complex wines. You take, uh, Morvedra takes on uh, fruit characteristics like blackberries, cranberries, cherries, stuff like that, but what it also takes on is the good stuff, the funky stuff, the stuff that I really like. Game meat, smoke, tobacco, spice, pepper, those types of things. That's where Morvedra really shines, is when it can take those fruit qualities, balance them out with those earthy qualities, and that is what I love about Morvedra. One last thing I wanted to touch on real quick before we get into this, like I said, there will be a lot more on Morvedra, a lot more on Texas coming soon, but the thing about Morvedra that works really well in Texas is it is late to bud. So what does that mean? So when you think about uh, the vines growing in the vineyard, it's where the grapes come from. This wine comes from somewhere, right? So uh, the grapes, they, uh, the, the Morvedra vines, they are late to bud break. In Texas, along with the warm climate, our primary, one of our primary issues is late spring, or I'm sorry, late winter, early spring frosts. So, and freezes. So, what you have with Morvedra is a, uh, a, a grape varietal that the vine's bud break comes later. So, we don't have to worry about having one of those 
you know, early spring freezes come in and wipe out all of our Morvedra uh, crops because uh, they don't bud until later. So that's all I want to say on that. There's going to be a little bit more on the write-up that's on the site, but let's jump into the wines. I wanted to start, I don't want to do this. Let me get these, actually I'm going to move these out of the way. These are coming over here. I wanted to start oldest to youngest. So we are starting with the Lewis. Is that in there? You can see that? Where are we going? We got it. Lewis Wines, 2013, Texas Morvedra. So you'll notice this has no real designation other than Texas. So a lot of wines uh, in Texas, you'll start seeing them uh, more with vineyard designations. You'll see them with some uh, Appalachian specific designations, High Plains, Hill Country, the two big ones in Texas. This is just a Texas Morvedra. Um, I, I don't know where exactly the fruit comes from. I'm going to assume since they didn't list the vineyard site, that means it's probably from a mix of different vineyard sites. Not positive on that. So right off the bat, we can see, let me get my blank page here. Right off the bat, we can see the color of it is, is really kind of a nice, almost leaning towards garnet, if you can see that. I don't know if you can see that, but it's leaning towards that garnet color, which I like. This is older as far as Texas wines are concerned, 2013. We're still figuring out what some of the ageability of wines in Texas are. Another part of being a newer wine region, trying to, to figure out what grapes can can last longer, uh, how long to lay wines down for. This is a 2013. I would say this is one of the older Texas wines um, that I've had in terms of now to the vintage. So um, definitely a little bit older. Right off the bat, the nose has almost, it's, it's a lot of cherry, almost like a Luden's cough drop, a little bit of medicinal uh, cherry. You remember those from as you were a kid? It's like they did really nothing to help your cough at all, but uh, Luden's uh, made a very tasty cough drop. Little medicinal, didn't do anything for the cough, tasted nice. I'm getting a little bit of that here, that Luden's, that Luden's cherry. But it's nice, I mean, it's not bad, it's not off-putting in any way. So the Ludens is on the palate, but it's it's savory. It's got a savory component to it. It's not that game. It's not that game meat. It's not tobacco. It's not smoke. But it is savory, peppery, a little pepper, a little pepper, but but strong cherry coming through. I'm thinking. So like I said, I have had this wine. I probably first tasted this 2013 Texas Morvedra vintage back maybe 2016 when I first tried this wine. And back then it, it, it seemed like there was a little bit more fruit, a little bit more uh, complexity. I'm, I'm thinking that maybe 2013 is slightly past the prime of this particular wine. Acidity is really nice. Real nice, fresh acidity, not a lot of tannin, like I said, um, in Bandol, in Spain, Morvedra, you see a lot of big, strong, almost rip your face off tannin at times if the wines haven't been aged properly or aged long enough. This has almost zero tannin. Uh, very much in that kind of Pinot Noir style. Would be really nice chilled, good acidity. I think the 13's a little past its prime, but this wine was really nice a few years ago, and I'm really interested to see how Lewis continues to make their uh, their Morvedras going forward because, again, they they are a wine that can develop really nice complexity with age. But again, Texas fruit, we're not sure on the age just yet. Next one on the list here, we have got Lost Draw. So I didn't really talk much about Lewis. Um, I was kind of getting a little bit jumping into the Texas Morved. Uh, in general, but uh, Lewis, so Lewis is a smaller producer 
in Texas. It is, if you think about where the majority of the wineries are in the state of Texas, they're along the 290 corridor in between Johnson City, Texas and Fredericksburg, Texas. Lewis is on the uh, the end very close to Johnson City. In fact, they're one of the wineries that is closest to Johnson City along that corridor. Smaller wines, uh, they, they make their wines in a, in a minimalist style, uh, kind of a, in, in that, I would say close to that kind of natural wine uh, type style where, where they're trying to not do too much and let the fruit really shine. So that is the Lewis style. Lost Draw is, uh, is in that, that kind of category of we started out as farmers, we were growing grapes to sell to other wineries to make their own wine with, but we never made our own wine. Well, people are starting to make some pretty good wines with our fruit. What's that all about? Maybe we should jump in and, uh, and see what we can do. So Lost Straw then started making their own wines. You still will see, it's interesting, you still will see people like William Chris and Lewis buying fruit from Lost Straw, making their wine. So you realistically could have a vintage where, let's say 2019, we've got a Morvedra from William Chris, we've got a 2019 from Lost Straw, and a 2019 from Lewis, all made with Lost Straw fruit different winemaking techniques, different aging uh, uh, situations going on, all can lead to different wines, all the fruit coming from Lost Draw. It's possible. I don't know if they're actually doing that. That was a hypothetical situation, so don't stick to that or, or, or hold me to that, um, but that is something that could happen. So this is the 2014, I think I already put it up there, but I'll do it again, 2014 Lost Draw High Plains Morvedra. So what you have with this, what we changed up a little bit here, the first one, the Lewis, just said Texas Morvet. This is Texas High Plains. So they're putting the actual Appalachian specific designation on this bottle because their fruit is all coming from their Lost Straw Vineyard in the High Plains. So 2014, so we step it up one year in vintage and this one's got the vineyard designate on it. Or not the vineyard designate, the Appalachian designate on it. This one has a little bit less of that garnet, it, it leads uh, more towards the ruby uh, category, but still nice light color. Um, like I, I talk about in the write-up, uh, Texas winemakers are making their Morvedras more in a style of Pinot Noir. Uh, when you see the, the old world, the big dark tannic ones in Texas, we're seeing lighter styles, nicely chilled, uh, good acid, not crazy with the tannin, the body, the color, all in that kind of medium. Uh, category. So we really think that Morvedra can be the Pinot Noir of Texas with the complexity that it can develop along with that nice medium body, lighter color, and, uh, and good strong acid. So let's, uh, let's dive in for a sniff. So Lost Straw, I, I talked about it a little bit in the, um, in the Jester King video uh, that I did, where Jester King beers, it's like if you smell a Jester King beer, it, you kind of sense this like Jester King essence. Smell the essence of Jester King. Uh, this essence of Jester King, uh, this similar essence to them. This essence, like I said before, you know what I'm talking about. There's an essence. Uh, Lost Draw kind of has that same thing going on. When you drink some of their, or when you, when you smell some of their wines, they have this distinct kind of Lost Draw nose on them. And this one definitely has that. It's got that kind of, uh, more of a cranberry on this one than the cherry that the, uh, that the Lewis had. Definitely more of a cranberry nose. Um, and a little bit of that, kind of sweet tobacco kind of coming through, but not overly, overly complex nose. It's, it's mostly that cranberry. Mm. Mm. Again, really good acid. It's not over the top in either of these first two wines. It's not over the top acid. It's just a really juicy, make your mouth water uh, type acid, which again, like in Texas, we need to find these wines that fit our, our weather, that fit our food, that fit our culture. And I think that wines like this, this big, 
punchy, juicy acid on wines that have complex noses and palates. Um, I don't think these are there yet in, in terms of the complexity, but just really gulpable, uh, really refreshing uh, wines coming from, from both of these so far. I'm actually gonna give that one a, a swallow. Where I think that the Lewis was um, a very savory uh, version, where with the age, some of that fruit has started to peel away. I think that 2014 seems to be a nice sweet spot uh, for the fruit to savory uh, kind of balance. Um, this Lost Draw one has a little bit more fruit on the palate a little bit more refreshing with that cranberry, um, with that cranberry, and, and and not so much the the savory qualities that the uh, the Lewis had. Yeah, more fruit, more fruit on the lost straw, for sure. Um, but the acid still still remains really nice. So we'll move these out of the way. William Chris. William Chris, uh, on this one, we actually have, as you can see, this is Texas High Plains, so we talked about Appalachian uh, designation on the bottle. This one has La Pradera Vineyard. So not only do we have an Appalachian designation, we have a vineyard designation to go along with it. This is a 2016, so we skipped a year, we're up to 2016 now. William Chris uh, Morvedra from La Pradera Vineyard. So William Chris, um, is a huge proponent, and, and uh, as are, I believe, Lost Straw and Lewis, but William Chris is a huge proponent of a movement that's happening in the Texas wine scene right now. A lot of the big guys, uh, the, the people who have been around for a little while, uh, they're still using California, Oregon fruit in their wine and calling it Texas wine. William Chris, along with some others, are starting a Texas wine movement, a 100% Texas wine movement. So uh, they believe that Texas wine should be made 100% with Texas fruit. Right now the rules are 75% of your fruit can be from Texas, 25% can be from anywhere, and you can still call it a Texas wine. Some people in Texas, and I can see the, the, the points of both, believe that for the Texas wine region to start being taken seriously, we need to be producing wines that are 100% from Texas fruit. William Chris is a big proponent of that, and uh, William Chris kind of falls into that category of, uh, they weren't the first winery in town, uh, they're certainly not the biggest, but uh, because of the quality products that they've put out over the last, say, five years, uh, they have really increased uh, their brand awareness, and people are starting to take note of William Chris as a very quality wine producer. So their popularity has really started to skyrocket, and what that has led to at times is William Chris putting out wines that are a little bit too young. Still good quality wines, they're just not ready to pop and drink. They're ready to lay down for a year or so before they're really ready to be drank. So uh, this wine, I don't believe falls in that category. It's a 2016, we're in 2019 right now. So uh, I think that um, this wine should be ready to go. Uh, I, I believe I tasted this wine about a year ago in their tasting room, really enjoyed it. Uh, that was, like I said, about a year ago. So I'm really curious to see how it's developed um, since I've laid it down. Nice color, again, light style. So all three of these have been in that light uh, color, um, light body uh, style. Mm. So this one has a little bit of that, that pepper, but it's almost like a, a green pepper quality to it. Not like a black pepper, um, more into that kind of bell pepper uh, quality. But still nice and fruity, nice and juicy uh, on the nose. So the acid on this one is not as strong as the first two. I would say the acid's slightly more restrained, but that doesn't make it a flabby wine by any by any stretch. Um, it's just not as punchy and sharp as the first two. And the tannin is slightly stronger. So this one, 
Uh, this one is leaning a little bit away from that high acid, low tannin, and a little bit more towards that medium, medium uh, area that, that's a really nice balance to hit. And it does, I could see this wine after maybe another year of laying down, developing some of those earthier qualities because I can smell a little bit almost like that wet forest floor type thing uh, that, that we talk about sometimes. That nice wet, those wet leaves, that kind of decaying uh, smell. Not like a manure smell, but like a decaying uh, vegetation smell, like a, like, a, like a wet forest floor. Yeah, I'm curious to see how this one uh, develops. Uh, I might need to, uh, I might need to pick up another bottle of this uh, when I'm down there next time because it, it it's got tannin, much more tannin than the first two. It's got the acid there, not as strong, but it's there for sure. Um, and it's a there's a little bit of that kind of that kind of earth kind of creeping in a little bit there, and uh, I think that could really develop nicely over about another uh, six months to a year of, uh, of aging. I don't think that it can go the distance. I don't think that it can go the distance, but uh, I do think that it could probably age for another year or two, develop a little bit more of that earthy complexity uh, and, and have that nice structure to, uh, to hold it through that. Um, so I think really nice efforts from all three wineries. I think that um, I would say my general consensus of this tasting today is um, I still continue to love all three of these uh, producers here. Uh, I would say that they're definitely in my top five uh, favorite Texas wine uh, producers. I think that the Morvedra scene in Texas is only going to continue to get better. As the vines that we've planted continue to get older, the fruit develops a, 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 a better quality. We have better vineyard management techniques that are put in place to help uh, uh, manage different things in that perspective. And then winemaking techniques uh, that continue to uh, get better uh, after harvest. I think that the Morvedra grape positions itself really nicely to make a splash in the state of Texas, it can produce a nice wine, light to medium style uh, body color, can be good chilled, pairs well with barbecue, that high acid cuts through that fatty brisket, and you can have those complex uh, flavors and, 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 and aromas that would really pair nicely with some of the food that we eat here in Texas, the barbecue, uh, the the steaks. I, I wouldn't put it towards that kind of steakhouse wine. Definitely not in that category. But definitely barbecue. Definitely steaks, burgers, um, things that you need some good smoky, earthy qualities to to uh, accompany along with that good juicy acid to help cut through the fat. I think that Morved puts itself in a great position for that. So more to come on Texas. More to come on Morved. Appreciate you being here with me today. Had a good time. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.